Let's open the Word of God to Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 40. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 40. Let's read responsively from the English Standard Version. Chapter 2 of the book of Acts, verses 32 to verse 40. This is the Word of God. This Jesus God raised up, and of all that we are witnesses. We receive from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. is poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Let's read together. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from the crooked generation. Amen. This is the Word of God. Uh, there was a professor by the name of uh, Jack Deere. Uh, and uh, it's a story about Jack Deere uh, in his office. Dr. Deere, I guess. Uh, and uh, he was receiving one of his students. His student, one of his students was paying him a visit. And the reason for the visit was uh, he was trying to submit an assignment and it was late. So he was trying to giving, give the professor the excuse, why, the, the tardiness, the reason that this uh, is late. And in the professor's mind, he already made up his mind to receive this uh, submission because he knew how busy sem uh, seminary um, students are and busy with the work and, and ministry and, and, and school and everything else. But uh, something happened. As I was hearing, listening to what the person was saying, just politely listening to the excuses and all that, he saw a word flashing on his face. It said, pornography. The professor was shocked, and uh, he didn't know what to respond, how to respond. But he just kind of ignored it. But it happened a second time. Pornography, this time it was blinking on the person's face. And because uh, Dr. Deere had been praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, he could not uh, pass by uh, this occasion. And um, with the awkwardness, he abruptly stopped the student. And he had to ask this question, knowing that if uh, he was wrong, the professor could get fired for accusing a student for wrongdoing. And he says, Oh, brother, by the way, are you struggling with pornography. And the student was shocked. He didn't know how to respond. He first wanted to deny it and um, just denial. But then the professor was so serious that he confessed. Actually, and it started his confession. I had been watching pornography since I was 14 and I cannot get off of it. And so this started a, uh, a con continuous sessions after sessions of, of uh, recovery and prayer and love. Of course, the professor did not tell on you know, him to the school and he didn't get you know, kicked out. But to the end of his uh, school, uh, until he graduated, uh, he was counseled and uh, the story goes that he was cured from this addiction. Later, Dr. Deere, uh, Jack Deere, he, uh, because he was at a very conservative seminary, he resigned uh, and uh, he moved on to another ministry uh, under John Wimble, uh, w uh, Wimber, I'm sorry, uh, the Vineyard Movement. And uh, he became ordained there and became a Pentecostal pastor uh, and uh, he became a very charismatic pastor. I want to ask this question, what does it mean to you to be led by the Holy Spirit? We hear that expression a lot throughout the year perhaps, you know, led by the Spirit. What does that exactly mean? Even in our 
evangelical circles, even in our Christian circles, that could mean a whole spectrum of things. From the charismatic saying, when you're led by the Spirit, it means that you hear the Word of God from somebody, or you speak in tongues, you see a supernatural manifestation. That is uh, what is being led by God, or the Spirit of God. In our Baptist, more conservative circles, you would say the Holy Spirit is more like a counselor. He is a teacher. He reminds us of what Jesus said. He helps us to live out the Christian life. What exactly does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? Uh, unless we know what that really means, we cannot live by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit of God. And this uh, rest of the summer, I'd like to touch on that topic of being led by the Spirit led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, we don't want to look at people's experiences or books or what uh, people have written on, but we want to go back straight to the Bible well, from the where first occurrence of the falling of the Holy Spirit happened and uh, what, it mean, what it meant for them to be led by the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, for the first series, first message on, of this uh, series, Led by the Spirit, I would like to talk about who is led by the Spirit of God? Who? Who can be led? Who is led by the Spirit of God? The passage of Scripture we read is a middle section of, of Peter's famous sermon. What had happened that he was preaching to this crowd of people in Jerusalem? As we well know, maybe from even last week, we've, uh, we, we can remember that Jesus told the disciples as he was going up to heaven, wait for the promised Spirit of God that Father will send to you. In fact, the disciples had to pray 10 days in the city of Jerusalem, although they didn't know it was going to be 10 days. On the day of Pentecost, it actually happened. 120 of the disciples and followers of Jesus Christ were waiting for that gift. They were waiting on the Spirit of God. And it happened all of a sudden. Like a, a, a whirlwind, like a, a, a big wind, um, maybe like the hurricane, you know, that over there, over there in uh, the southern, eastern part of the uh, U.S. right now. Uh, it happened suddenly, and uh, they could visibly see it. We know well that the tongues of fire fell upon the congregants. It was not like a glob of fire just everywhere, and we know that the presence of God is here. It was unique experience. It was on every individual person. This tongue of fire was on the head of every individual person. It fell on each person individually. And there were sounds involved too. What sounds were there? People started to speak in different languages. Languages that uh, they, they were not born into. It was not their first language, but they were speaking and praising God in a foreign language. And there's all this commotion and this uh, uh, amazing scene. People of Jerusalem, they were wondering, what's going on? What's all this noise? And what's all the languages we're hearing? Uh, we're hearing the, these tongues in our own tongues. What's happening here? These are Jewish people, people living, coming from Galilee, coming from Judea and, and, and Jerusalem. How can they speak these things? And so we know from Scripture, this passage, chapter 2, that Peter gets up. He uses his occasion to deliver his famous sermon. The gist of his sermon was that Jesus Christ, whom you killed on the cross, God raised. And he is the one who promised the Holy Spirit. And because he is risen, he also uh, is alive right now. He is reigning. He has sent this Spirit, and you are seeing this Spirit among us. That was the gist of Peter's message that day. And in verse 32, uh, towards the end of his sermon, the passage we just read this morning, Peter says in concise words uh, what, how that this had happened and who, to whom this uh, spirit was given. Let's go back to verse 32. It says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Who has received the Holy Spirit? Those who are the witnesses of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Who can receive the Holy Spirit? Those who are the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ are those who can receive the Spirit of God. What did it mean for Peter to be a witness of Jesus? And so Peter takes them, the audience, back to an ancient promise 
He had to remind them of something. He reminded them of the Psalm of David, what David had said in Psalm 110, verse 1. And it was from that famous messianic psalm how God told his son, his Lord, David's Lord, Jesus, to uh, stay put until I make your enemy your footstool. And God was going to raise him up, exalt him. And Peter's looking back at that promise and saying, guys, you know what? God the Father in, indeed exalted Jesus by raising him up from the dead. And he has made him, Jesus, the Lord and God of all. He was explaining how Jesus was exalted through his resurrection. And also Peter was telling them that we are the witnesses. We've seen Jesus resurrect. We've seen Jesus go on to the heaven. We know that he is at the right hand of God. He is the reigning God. And so Peter was saying we are the witnesses of the resurrection. We are the witnesses that Jesus indeed is the Son of God. And because we are witnesses, we have the Holy Spirit. What was the gift of this Holy Spirit then? What happened? What are the signs of this gift? Um, it's explicit and implicit in our passage. There are at least two signs that we can see uh, ex implicitly and explicitly. First of all, obvious sign is that they were able to make a lot of noise, right? They were speaking in different languages. Supernatural phenomena happened. And this truly was the gift of the Holy Spirit. But more subtle but more apparent and it gets stronger and stronger as we read in the book of Acts. The second gift of the Holy Spirit was that Peter and the disciples had this tremendous assurance and conviction of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he really was the Son of God. Jesus Christ was resurrected. He was the Son of God, the Christ that they had been waiting for and he still lives. That assurance, that confidence and conviction was the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was such a great conviction and, and power and energy that it kept the disciples and all the people, followers of Jesus, uh, strong in the face of persecution and objection and even the you know, uh, um, uh, martyrdom. They were able to stand, uh, stand strong in their faith. This truly was the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the identity did not come from their within. They're, they didn't persuade themselves that we are now Christ's followers and now we have a mission to accomplish. It was, a gift of, it was the gift of the Holy Spirit that gave them the confidence, a new identity from without, from, from the outside, that gave them this confidence to be the witness of Jesus Christ. And that person who gave them that power, that gift, was the Holy Spirit. We can look at in Romans chapter 8 verse 30, 26, and it tells us about how the Holy Spirit gives us that gift. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Brothers and sisters, you know, no matter how aged or I should say matured you are, mature you are in life, advanced in life, even if until your, the death, day of your death, we're all fearful of something every day. We are fearful of the unknown. We're fearful of death. We're fearful of, for our, uh, the uncertainty that we meet every day. But what the Holy Spirit does is that He gives us a new identity, a, a new foundation, a, a new love and presence in our lives of God. And He helps us with that weakness to live strong, to be confident as a person of Jesus Christ. A person who is willing to witness that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. Normally we think, when we think of uh, being led by the Spirit, we think of uh, speaking in tongues, gifts, word of knowledge, or maybe like uh, Dr. Deere, that, you know, something we see some, on uh, color or word of somebody. Well, that, those can be included in the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can do all those things. But more prominently, and more often than not, than, uh, than not we see that Jesus, uh, Spirit gives us the power to live as a witness of Jesus Christ. He gives us the identity that we are. Christians, that we are sons and daughters of God. That is the tremendous power the Holy Spirit gave Peter and disciples, and that is the same power that he gives 
you and me as Christians as we worship Him this morning. Amen? I might have gave this illustration before, but uh, think of a uh, hydroelectric you know, generator like at a dam, right? Uh, you see this great, you know, um, a dam, uh, uh, you know, a powerhouse. And uh, in order to turn those great turbines and generate electricity, it's not those rough currents that you do the, you know, right, uh, whitewater rafting on. It's not those currents and then the, 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 uh, uh, the foam and the fluff that turns those turbines. In fact, even though they might be strong too, it is deep underneath the riverbed. There is a great current, a silent current, that turns and rotates those great turbines. And when those turbines are moved and turned and rotated, it generates electricity for an entire community, for an entire city, in fact. That is like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit work is not just speaking in tongues and seeing a flashing of words and just uh, instantaneous, some kind of uh, miracle in our lives. Yes, those can be included. But the real work of the Holy Spirit is when He touches your heart and my heart and confirms to us that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He has died on the cross and He has resurrected. And someday, He will come back to reign upon our lives and to, to make the wrong right that He is God. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God that gives us that, that encouragement, that confidence and assurance to live as a witness of Jesus Christ. What is the witness of Jesus Christ? It's a person who has experienced Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. A witness of Jesus Christ is a person who is willing to share that, that word, that confidence, assurance with somebody else. Throughout the book of Acts, we will see that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And yes, they, they did miracles. Yes, they spoke in tongues. Yes, they, they saw the future as God revealed it to them. But more than that, we see the disciples not hesitant at all to share that Jesus is the risen Lord, that He is the Son of God, truly. He, and they were even willing to die for them. In fact, all the 12 disciples, except for John, all were persecuted and, and they were martyred for this tremendous Assurance, this conviction and confidence that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Not was the Lord, but He is the Lord of them all. And this is the image. This is the, uh, the person that Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit leads. They have the confidence that Jesus is the Lord. They, per they uh, confess that Jesus is Lord, just like the Bible says here. That God has made Him Christ and Lord of all. And we confess the same thing, and those people, we call them the witnesses of Jesus Christ. So, who can be led by the Holy Spirit? This is very important. Uh, it's not just, you know, like a witch, you know, or a, uh, you know, uh, magical something that it, sometimes a uh, spirit comes to you and you speak all these magical things. No. Those who confess, those who witness Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, and God, are those who are led by the Spirit of God. As you know, we've been to uh, the mission field uh, past week, and I was so proud of them, but also a little bit was concerned for them, because as you know, some of them, a handful of them, was their first mission trip ever in their life. They had, so that was the first time they ever did a testimony for a crowd of people. It was the first time that they did a public prayer before others, it was maybe the first time that some of them sang a, uh, a special song uh, at another culture, in another culture, in a language. Maybe it was a uh, first time uh, sharing the gospel with the people uh, around them. And to be frank, I gave them a little push, you know, do this. I, I did gave them a gentle push. But uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, surprised to see that none of them, I can tell you, none of them uh, rejected. They did not back off. But uh, they did what they were to do. And they, were, they did it with the joy that comes from the Lord. And I see that as the Holy Spirit. As Holy Spirit encourages them to speak the word of truth. To speak Jesus Christ. To sing the words of Jesus. To pray for the sick. To pray and, and share Jesus with those who do not know Him. I've seen and witnessed the work of the Holy Spirit. Strongly working in our midst and praise the Lord for what he has done. Amen.
and uh, don't take my word for it. Ask them, our two ladies <laughs> uh, here. And so we praise our Spirit, Holy Spirit. Who is led by the Holy Spirit? Jesus' witnesses are led by the Spirit of God. If we are witnesses, God uses our lips, right? So this is my challenge and application to you. A small application is that for in order for us to be led by the Spirit of God, I pray that our lips will be sanctified. Our lips will be saved. Most of the times in, in daily life, not Sunday, but maybe Monday or maybe Thursday, Wednesday, we use our lips to share, show our frustration in life. We are tired. We complain. We don't give uh, thanks to God. But I pray that our lips will be sanctified. And instead of uh, words of complaint, we can say, praise the Lord. We see a glimpse of God in our lives. Praise the Lord. It was all Him and not me. In our frustration, we can say, God will make a way. We can even say that my Savior lives. In those circumstances when you're all, you're, you're come to a dead end. And the only way to look is to look up. You can say, my Savior lives. It is a confession that comes from you being a witness of Jesus Christ. You having a faith in a true shepherd that reigns over your life. Over your life. It is a confession of love to our Lord Jesus that you truly trust him and rely upon him to get, to get by each day. When we have those lips of the witness of Jesus Christ, witness that he is alive and he is the Lord, we can have received the gift of the Holy Spirit who gives us the confidence and conviction to live each day, each day as a child of God. Who are led by the Spirit of God? Those who confess Jesus as their Lord. Those who confess, witness Jesus as their resurrected Lord receive the Holy Spirit's power. But there's a second, and it is this. Those who repent are led by the Spirit of God. In your outlines, I read, right, wrote something differently, but I want you to be, uh, change it if you can. Those who repent are led by the Spirit of God. Not just the receivers of the gift of the Holy Spirit, but those who are repenting are led by the Spirit of God. When the Jews who are hearing Peter's message, they realized what was happening, what had happened, they became spiritually so thirsty and, and they, were, they became desperate. And uh, verse 37 shows us a glimpse of their heart. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Just like when you put salt in water, salt in a food, you know, it, it, it creates a thirst. It creates an environment where, where you want something so badly. This, when the word of God, when the truth was sprinkled in the hearts of the people who were listening to this message, they were desperate for two things, at least two things. First of all, they realized that they were the ones who had killed the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God. And so they were guilty. Their heart was cut in half. And, and there was this, this tremendous uh, desire to make it right. So that was the first thirst they had. The second one was envy. I wish I had the confidence that these disciples had. I don't have that kind of, that kind of confidence and conviction. If what they're saying is true, that God had promised the Spirit of God on, the, on His people, and it came through Jesus Christ, I don't want to miss out. I want that. I want that boldness and conviction that they have. I don't have that kind of uh, clarity about God. I want the Spirit of God in my life. It created that thirst in the hearers' hearts. So they had to ask Peter and disciples, Brothers, what shall I do to receive this gift of the Holy Spirit? Who can receive the gift of the Spirit? Who can be led by the Spirit? That was the question that was on the minds of people. And indeed, Peter uh, gives it to them how they could re receive the Spirit and how they could be led by the Spirit of God. Let's look at verse 38. It's very clear on this. 
says, actually, can we read this together? Verse 38 together. Uh, one more time. Ready, go. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Long sentence, but in a nutshell, saying this. Repent, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's in between? Peter is describing what it means to repent. What does it mean to repent? Uh, going back to that verse. Baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Saying, accept the fact, believe the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died and resurrected. And you've experienced Jesus' miracles firsthand. And we are witnesses of his resurrection. And we are saying that Jesus lives. All 120 of us, in fact, 500 of us, saw the risen Lord. And as you receive this Jesus, as he has ministered to you, as you receive our word, as we saw Jesus, as was prescribed by the scripture of God in Psalm 110, you repent, you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. And then, as a result, as a gift, as a bonus, the Holy Spirit will come on you. So Peter was very clear on how to receive the Holy Spirit. It was to repent. Why is repentance important to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Who receives the Holy Spirit? I thought those who are spiritual receive the Holy Spirit. If you pray a lot and you ask for that, that desire to give me the gift of the Holy Spirit, give me the gift of seeing, of prophecy, of speaking in tongues, I thought those who are the ones who receive the, Holy, the gift of the Spirit. But Peter says anybody can receive the gift of the Spirit. In fact, he makes it extra clear for us. Uh, in 30, 39, the next verse that uh, we read, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Anyone can be led. Anyone can receive this Holy Spirit. But the one condition is repentance. I picture a water faucet, you know, or water fountain, water coming out from, from the, uh, the spout. And uh, it's free for everyone. God has opened the faucet, so water is just gushing out. The Holy Spirit is being poured upon this earth. Those who can receive the Spirit are those who can cup the water in their hands, receive the Holy Spirit, who can agree with the Spirit that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But who cannot receive the Holy Spirit? It is those who are, have turned their hands like this. And they are, their, their hands are backhanded. And so no matter how much Spirit is being poured upon this earth, upon our, 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 our land, as a result of the work of Jesus Christ, they are not the beneficiary. They cannot receive, nor can they be led by the Spirit of God. What does this mean? Those who still hang on to themselves as the Lord of their lives. They can never receive the Holy Spirit. Only those who are open-handed and saying, I am not the Lord of my life. I am not God. You, Jesus, are my God. You've proved, proven it on the cross and through resurrection. Those who are open-handed can receive the Holy Spirit. That's why Peter is saying anyone can receive the Spirit. Anyone can be led by the Spirit of God if you receive. As you repent, turn from the sin of you being the God of your life and turn to Jesus Christ as the exalted Son of God who is reigning right now. And as a result of this preaching of Peter, many people indeed received the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, which we haven't read the next verse, tells us that on just on that one day, as they heard the message of Peter, and as they received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, 3,000 people received the Holy Spirit and became Christians on that very day. In our hearts, um, we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I believe maybe all of you, most of you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior at some point in your life by repenting of your sins. And have, right now, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Correct? Yeah, not sure. <laughs> yes, amen. We, we know that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit confirms for us that He is with us. 
However, how come we have the Holy Spirit? We have received the gift of the Holy Spirit that Peter is talking about. But we don't feel led by the Spirit of God. How, don't, how come we don't, we, we don't ex, uh, experience the things that are happening in the book of Acts? If we have indeed have the same Holy Spirit, why aren't, why are our, our lives like this? Somehow our, our Holy Spirit in our life is a, is a watered down version from uh, the first Holy Spirit. What's going on? No. Just like, we have to go back to what Peter says. How can we receive the Holy Spirit? How can we be led by the Spirit of God every day? We have to consistently be confessing our sins to God. Because you see, although all of us at one time have repented and said, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You are my God. But as we live our lives each day, as there's temptation, as our sin, there's sin in our lives, we tend to turn our hands and say, you know what? I can take care of this. I think I can handle it from here. Maybe in some ways you're saying, Lord, you've led me thus far and I'm so thankful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I can take it from here. I'll just do it. Because this is my familiar territory. You know, this is my turf. I know better. As our hearts are like that, we are turning our hands against God. And when we do this, God cannot lead us. The Holy Spirit cannot lead us where he wants to lead. How can we continually be led by the Spirit of God? How can we feel his presence each day? Just like Peter said, we need to repent and confess of our hard-heartedness, saying, God, I want to let go of this thing that I'm trusting right now. Oh, God, I, I was like this, but without my knowing, I've become like this. God, I want to let go of myself being the Lord in this area. Once again, I want to be open-handed to you. I want to confess my sins. I want to be with you. When we live a life of confession of our sins every day, because we always have a tendency to fall back to our sinful nature, we need to confess every day. There is no other way uh, than that, than confessing, to be led by the Holy Spirit. There is a phrase in the Bible that describes a person who has already received the Holy Spirit, but chooses not to confess, chooses not to repent. And that phrase is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And that's the person who grieves the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Spirit is there because he never leaves once you accept him in, his, in your heart, accept Jesus in your heart. He's always there. But because you have hardened your heart, you do not confess your sin, you do not proclaim Jesus Christ as the Lord in a particular area of your life, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Who are those who grieve the Holy Spirit? Those people are people who have the Holy Spirit in their hearts. But they use the name of the Spirit of God to rationalize sin in their lives. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, He convicts us of sin. He convicts us of things that does not please our Lord Jesus Christ. That is His specific role. But sometimes, instead of we giving in, submitting to the Holy Spirit, we want the Spirit to submit to us. Oh, Spirit of God, you know what? That's not really what it means. It means this. And we tend to rationalize and use, maybe abuse the Holy Spirit to affirm our sinful hearts or behavior. And when that happens, the Bible says it, calls it, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. Whether consciously or unconsciously, sometimes we do such things. We use the name of the Holy Spirit to rationalize um, sin. We, uh, I see some people rationalize an unbiblical uh, divorce and say, say that this was led by the Holy Spirit. They are mentioning the Holy Spirit to say, that uh, they are, as they're using their finances inappropriately, not God honor, honoring me, but for their own selfish gain, they say, the Holy Spirit led me to do this or that. The other uh, organizations today, so-called Christian organizations, saying that uh, we can now celebrate a new sexual identity and we're liberated and the Holy Spirit led us to do this. 
grieves the Holy Spirit. We must remember the Holy Spirit is a holy spirit. He's not a spirit that, that uh, co- encourages sin or compromise in, a, in our life. He is a holy spirit that distinguishes, that wants our life to be, to, be, to be separated from sin. He is the Holy Spirit. When we use and abuse the Holy Spirit to gratify our sinful desires and our wants, it uh, greatly grieves the Holy Spirit. We must not grieve the Holy Spirit. In fact, we should be grieved over the sins that grieves the Holy Spirit. That is the life of the Christian. The Holy Spirit never goes against the good word of God. The Holy Spirit never goes against the teachings of Jesus Christ. And when someone says they're going to do this and it's against Scripture and the Holy Spirit said that, we can know that it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was a different spirit. When the Holy Spirit indeed gives us this cutting of the heart, He is displeased. This is not having Jesus as the Lord of your life. When He convicts us of that, brothers and sisters, I pray that we would have that soft heart and say, Jesus, I confess. I have done wrong. I have been the Lord of this life, of the area of my life. I have to confess this past week. You know, I confessed to the Lord and I prayed, asked for His forgiveness. I had that mentality after a week of, you know, full of Holy Spirit ministry and well, work, work well done. I, tell, I told God, I found myself telling God, God, now I'm back. I know my church. I know my people. I've done this over seven, six, seven years. I can take it from here. And maybe that's why I'm not led by the Holy Spirit as much as I was led in the mission field. And I confess my sins to Him. Brothers and sisters, I implore you that we should confess our daily sins every day. Once uh, D.L. Moody, the uh, great revivalist of Chicago, said this, Repentance is like putting uh, a fist, your f- a fist inside a vase, a flower vase, like a vase here. Having your fist inside the vase. There was a young boy, you know, he got his hand stuck into the vase. And the parents were, from that, uh, they were just uh, uh, so scared. And so they applied soap and oil, they did everything they could. And at the end, they could not get his fist out. So as a final resort, they, had to, they decided to break the vase, finally. The boy was scared at this point and said in a, in a very small and soft voice to his parents, Daddy, would it help if I let go of the penny that I'm holding on in the vase right now? Would it help? Indeed, he was holding on to this penny. Brother and sister, we are so stubborn uh, before God. We confess, we've repented our sins, but all of a sudden we find ourselves tomorrow, today, our hand is is uh, stuck. It's grabbing onto a sin in our lives and saying, God, I don't want to let this go. You know, you could do everything about me and everything for me. You're the Lord of all and all that, but you know, I can take care of this. I know better than you. When we internally say those things, we're not letting go of the sin that he wants us to let go. Holy Spirit convicts us of those, thi- of those things. And when we let go of this sinful living, Holy Spirit takes over and he can lead us into places that glorifies God, expands the kingdom of God beyond our imagination. So brothers and sisters, let us repent of the sin of being God, playing God in our lives. And let's uh, be the witness of Jesus Christ, professing that Jesus is my Lord with our, with our mouths and with our lives so that the Holy Spirit can take over and he will lead us to, way, to, to his wonderful, amazing plans that he has for all of us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.